So I think there's a lot that you and I will sort of take for granted as sure. sort of understood in the field, but maybe we can lay it out for our viewers a little bit. So what would you describe evolutionary psychology as a subset of psychology to be, and why have you chosen that as your framework for understanding the of course. things that you focus on? Evolutionary psychology is the very simple and uh, undebatable premise that our brain, our mind, does not come out of magic. It comes out of the exact same evolutionary forces that explain all of life. And so the processes of sexual selection, of natural selection, is precisely what has defined our personhood. And so in the same way that we might use uh, evolutionary thinking to explain uh, how our uh, liver functions, how our kidneys function, how our lungs function, well, evolutionary psychologists argue that if we truly wish to fully understand uh, the human mind, we have to apply the same evolutionary lens to understand, as I said, the most important organ of our body that defines our personhood. And so there are a couple of key tenets that define, if you like, the, 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 the foundation of what evolution psychology is. Uh, number one, we're not born with empty slates. Uh, there are absolute biological imperatives that are coded as we come into the world. This is why you can give children who are in the pre-socialization stage images of beautiful people and less beautiful people and they point and look at and stare at the beautiful people longer. By definition, they couldn't have been socialized. They are in the cognitive developmental stage where they can't yet be socialized. So that's number one. We're not blank slate uh, creatures. Secondly, the, uh, much of psychology looks at our mental faculties as being domain general. So for example, our intelligence as a domain general ability, capability. So I could use my intelligence to find a mate, to watch a movie and find it funny, to solve a calculus problem. So it is a domain general ability that I can apply. It's a universal key that I apply across domains. Evolutionary psychologists don't reject that. They, they accept that, of course, there are such domain general mechanisms, but they then argue that there are also domain specific computational systems, each of which has evolved to solve a specific recurring evolutionary problem in our evolutionary past. So find mate, retain mate, uh, uh, avoid predators, avoid poisonous foods, look for nutritious foods, build coalitions, invest in kin. Each of these fundamental evolutionary problems would have necessitated specific computational systems, domain specific computational systems in our brains. Now this doesn't mean that those systems are topographically located in a specific region, they could be diffuse, as many of them are, but it does imply that there are these pensions that have evolved to solve specific problems. Right, and uh, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, because again, I come from anthropology as opposed to psychology, even though the, the subject matter often overlaps. So part of the contention in the field of psychology or between different disciplines is just to what degree those systems really are modular and not okay. domain specific versus sort of tendon overarching tendencies that play out in uh, specific um, contextual uh, circumstances, right? right? So um, would it be safe to say that evolutionary psychology as a discipline tends to put more emphasis on the modularity and the sort of the, the domain specific nature of those of those different sub abilities, so to speak? It, I mean, it does, but that doesn't imply that it also don't, doesn't look at the contingencies that you're speaking of. So one of the things that evolutionists argue uh, and I use the term evolutionist more broadly because while many people uh, define themselves as evolutionary psychologists, the broader term is really evolutionary behavioral sciences because uh, human ethology is a field that applies evolutionary thinking, but they're usually not coming from an evolutionary psychology perspective. Behavioral ecologists are also within that rubric. Sociobiologists are also. Darwinian anthropologists are within. So the broader field, if you'd like, is evolutionary behavioral sciences, of which evolutionary psychology is one of the branches. Right. So behavioral ecologists, to your point, are the evolutionists who study why it is that different uh, behavioral plasticity manifests itself. So for example, in one culture, you might have the evolution of spicy cuisine. In another culture, you have the evolution of bland cuisine. And we're, when we're talking evolution here, we mean cultural evolution. Cultural That's evolution, thank you, exactly. Evolution. exactly. Yeah. Uh, but incidentally, n nurture happens in its form because of nature. It's not as though they are antithetical to each other. It, it, nothing exists outside of your biological realm, right? So in a sense, that's a, uh, a false dichotomy, nature or nurture. 
I think Matt Ridley had a book called uh, Nurture by Nature. I love that term because it's exactly apt in describing the false dichotomy. So in the case of going back to the spices, if, if I were, say, a, a cultural anthropologist, uh, I would simply revel at the recognition that there are cross-cultural differences. Look, the Malaysian and Me Mexicans eat spicier foods, while the Swedes and, and Danes eat less spicy food. Good night, everyone. Whereas a more interesting question is to then ask, why is it that these cultural traditions have evolved in, in this particular way? Not all will necessarily have a biological explanation, but in the case of spices, it's actually a very clear biological explanation. It turns out that if you map the distribution of spicy or non-spicy foods around the world, it correlates to the ambient temperature of those cultures. Cultures that have hotter climates are more likely to have food pathogens, are more likely to have the greater proliferation of food pathogens. Therefore, a cultural adaptation, spices, cuisine, is a solution to a biological problem. It's called the antimicrobial hypothesis. So once you incorporate that additional layer of an explanation, now you have a much richer explanation, which leads me to the third. So I mentioned uh, evolution psychology is not tabula rasa. Evolution psychology is recognizing that there are both domain specific and domain general module. The third important thing to recognize about evolutionary theory in general, not just evolution psychology, is that it makes a distinction between proximate and ultimate explanations. Proximate explanations is where much of science operates. It explains the how and the what of a phenomenon. Most Nobel Prizes have been won at the proximate level. There's nothing wrong with that. But the ultimate explanation, not ultimate in the superior sense, but ultimate in the unfolding of the Darwinian why. Why has the phenomenon evolved to be of that form? So to give you a very uh, specific example, if you take pregnancy sickness, uh, women have experiences around the world since time immemorial. There are many proximate questions I can ask. How does the fluctuating hormone levels of a woman affect the severity of her symptoms? Okay, that's a proximate question. Great. The ultimate question would be, why has this physiological response evolved to be of that form? And the answer turns out to be a very beautiful and elegant one, and not only with many theoretical implications, but many practical applications. Uh, and during the first trimester of gestation, there's a period called organogenesis, where the organs of the fetus are forming in utero. During that period, it's particularly uniquely important that the, 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 uter the, the, the fetus not be exposed to teratogens. Why do women love pickles during, when they're pregnant? Because pickling is an antimicrobial mechanism, if you like, just like spices, just like salting. So, uh, they avoid certain other foods and drinks that are likely to be high on teratogens. Even though pickling itself is a completely cultural phenomenon. Th that's right. It, right. But so th the manner by which you resolve the microbial problem might manifest itself in slightly different ways across different niches. But you would expect that these cultural adaptations ultimately are rooted in some biological cause. Okay. So now, uh, so number one, women are attracted to certain foods, avoid other foods when they are during this period. They feel nauseous. And then the final insurance policy is that they vomit. They vomit because if by chance I have been exposed to some of these dangerous uh, pathogens, then I'm going to expel them. Now you might say, okay, that sounds like a great uh, theoretical explanation, but who cares? How do you test this? How do you know this is right? How do you know this is really an adaptation? Well, it turns out that women who experience more pregnancy sickness are less likely to have miscarriages. Women who experience pregnancy sickness more are more likely to have a good outcome in terms of having a you know, healthy child uh, upon you know, have, giving birth. Uh, now, when you go see your OBGYN and you say, hey, look, I'm really suffering from severe symptoms of pregnancy sickness. Typically, people call it morning sickness because you have it in the morning, but the more general term is pregnancy sickness. What is he or she likely to do? It's prescribe a medicine that softens, that er eradicates those symptoms. From an evolutionary perspective, that's the perfectly wrong thing to do. Uh, so, and, and I've lectured about this, say, in an MBA class where I've got a lot of physicians who are in the, uh, med uh, in the medical industry but now are trying to get an MBA, and then they'll come up to me and say, Dr. Sam, how come I didn't learn all this stuff in medical school? Well, because you don't learn about evolution, even in medical school where you think it would be na very natural for you to learn it. 
So a colleague of mine, Randy Nesse, who's been on my show, is one of the pioneers of evolutionary medicine. He's a physician himself by training. And he's trying, if you'd like, to Darwinize the medical school curriculum, not unlike how I'm trying to Darwinize the business school. So that gives you a sense of evolutionary psychology in general. That's wonderful. Yeah, that's a great sort of overarching way of encapsulating the field. So then the next point, I suppose, is it's not immediately obvious to someone like me how the, how the evolutionary approach to understanding the social sciences applies to business or commerce or why one would do that necessarily. Sure. So what led you down that path? Right, right. So going back to the original genesis, because I always like, love to give a shout out to the man who turned me into an evolutionary uh, scientist. Uh, his name is Professor Dennis Regan. He was a, adva- a social psychologist. I was taking a advanced social psychology course at my first semester as a doctoral student at Cornell on the advice of my uh, then doctoral supervisor, Jay Russo, who himself is a very well-known uh, cognitive psychologist. And maybe about halfway through the semester, this was not an evolutionary psychology course. Uh, this was a social psychology course. About halfway through the semester, uh, Professor Regan uh, assigned a book called Homicide, uh, written by a husband and wife team, Martin Daly and Margot Wilson, from McMaster University, fellow Canadians, uh, two of the pioneers of evolutionary psychology. And in the book, what they do is they demonstrate certain uh, evolutionary principles that explain universal patterns of criminality. So, for example, if you look at, I'll give you two quick examples, and I think the audience will get a sense of what they're talking about. So, if you look at um, what is the number one factor or predictor that can best help us understand uh, what's the biggest danger to a child as it is growing up. So, in other words, is it the fact that he or she grew up in poverty? Is it that they have an alcoholic father? Is it So there's a million possible explanations and we can identify the strength of how predictive they are in explaining the likelihood of childhood. Well, uh, maybe, I don't want to put the, you on the, the like, spot. The likelihood of, uh, of a child being abused if that characteristic or reality exists. Do you understand what I'm saying? So let's suppose there are 50 possible predictors. Yeah. What do you think would be the number one best predictor for a child uh, experiencing child uh, abuse? Uh, by the way, it is 100-fold greater predictor than the next predictor. Now, wow. for your audience that may not understand, if you usually have a 1.2 odds ratio, that means it's 20% more. That's a usually significant effect. A hundred-fold is, is unheard of, okay? Uh, so can you guess at all without putting you on the spot? So what factor would, would make it more likely for a child to be abused in the domestic exactly. context? And, and there are many different ways by which we could define it. Abuse can be neglect, abuse can be sexual abuse, abuse right. can be uh, emotional abuse. Putting it all together for now, all the different manifestations of abuse, what's the number one predictor? I would guess something like substance abuse by the parents, something okay. like that. Good guess, yeah. and, and certainly that's likely to have some predictive power if there is a step parent in the house, okay? Hmm. Okay, Uh, now, why? It's not terribly difficult once you understand evolutionary theory. We are a biparental species. Both parents typically invest quite a bit. Uh, Most people are not terribly pleased with the idea of spending their time and effort raising someone else's child. Now, that doesn't mean that if you offer an explanation for something that you're condoning it or justifying it, which is an, uh, often what I hear from the tracts of EP. Oh, but Dr. Saad, so, so you're basically offering an explanation, so it's okay to do child abuse? This is, a, I think, a huge problem, as far as I've seen, with the public understanding of science and of evolutionary science in particular, right? Because there's this conflation, this sort of blurring between between normative and descriptive exactly. counts. Exactly. Uh, yeah. and, and usually my response to them is, right, uh, Einstein, because when an oncologist explains pancreatic cancer, that's because he's justifying it. That's because he is pro-pancreatic cancer. Then they usually go away. Uh, so uh, step parent is exactly what explains the universal fable of Cinderella. And which became known after an evolutionary theory as the Cinderella effect, actually written by Martin Daly and Margot Wilson, the same authors. Uh, Cinderella is abused by her evil stepmother because she's a stepmother who, who cares about her two biological daughters, but not her stepdaughter. Okay? Uh, and you find this behavior, by the way, in many other species. Uh, this is where you have what are called 
homologous phenomena where the same phenomenon manifests itself across many different species. So the, in lion society, they're usually, the way the society is structured, there's a pride made up of many females, their children, and one, two, possibly three dominant males. They'll, and then uh, the young males, as they be, enter sexual maturity, are kicked out of the group. Well, so there's all these really f sexually frustrated young male that are coming into sexual maturity that would like to find a pride to take over and then have sexual access to the females. Well, the two dominant males will, or let's say, let's call them two, they could be two, three, one. For many, many years, they can repel those incursions. But one day nature catches up to you and those uh, dominant males are now older uh, they're no longer as powerful, they're either killed or more often they quickly learn what's going to happen to them and they leave the pride. And by the way, the, their trajectory is usually a very sad one when they're left alone. Uh, the new males come in and what's the first order of the day? What's the first thing they do on their to-do list that day? They kill all the cubs. Why do they kill all the cubs? Because those cubs, by definition, could not have been sired by them. And there is no point in me spending all my uh, evolutionary investment investing in someone else's uh, uh, genetic material, if I can put it that way. Now, what happens when they do kill all the cubs? The females that, whose cubs were just killed by those dominant males go into estrus. In other words, as I tell my students, and they're all sort of transfixed, I say in the human context, we get the ladies in the mood by playing Barry White music. Uh, with lions, we kill the females' children, and that's how we get them in the mood, so to speak, if I'm saying it facetiously. But Gad, doesn't that mean that you're, uh, you're supporting uh, li lion, lion infanticide? Remember, exactly. <laughs> but that's what you keep hearing over. I so. know, yeah, it's frustrating. And people, people don't appreciate the fact that Humans have both wonderful qualities, which evolutionary theory explains, empathy, romantic love, sibling love, friendship love, cooperation. All of these things are perfectly within the purview of evolutionary psychology, but evolutionary psychology also recognizes that we're not walking saints and angels. We also kill each other. We experience murderous rage and anger and jealousy and uh, humans rape and humans abuse and humans go to war. Those are also part of the behavioral repertoire of our existence. And therefore, when you explain the nice stuff of humans, everybody's quiet. When you explain the bad stuff, oh, what a Nazi you must be. You're condoning uh, cheating on your husband or wife. No, I'm not condoning it. I'm explaining that it happens tons of times and let's try to understand why it happens. It's not because of pornography. Why, why do you think people have that reaction though? Like it, just psychologically speaking, if you're, you know, you're a psychologist, so how, how do you explain the fact that people have like intensely different visceral reactions yeah. to the same theories or you know, just de describing different phenomena? It's, yeah, so I'll explain that and then I'll go back to sure. the, the, yep. the, the homicide book just to close that parenthesis. Yep. So in one of my books, The Consuming Instinct, but in many other places, I offer an analysis of the wide range of uh, reactions that people have to evolutionary theory in general and evolutionary psychology in particular. And they come in many different varieties. Some of them are cognitive obstacles. Some of them are uh, emotional obstacles. But almost always they're due to ideological issues because evolutionary theory ends up attacking the foundational edifice of some pet ideology of mine. And I can't have that. If evolution is right, then I'm screwed. And therefore I'm going to fight against it. So if I'm a religious person, I hate evolution because where is God in all this? We're not unique. We're not. Okay. If I am a radical feminist, I hate evolution psychology because you're saying there are innate sex differences. That's craziness. If I am a postmodernist, I hate evolutionary psychology because evolution, uh, postmodernism says there are no universal truths. Well, of course, evolution psychology recognizes that there's a thing called human universals. Uh, so for all sorts of ideological reasons, people line up to throw mud at evolutionists. Uh, some of the slightly more sophisticated, sophisticated in quotes, detractors, and, and actually that's probably the one that upsets me the most, is because it is levied by otherwise supposedly intelligent academics, uh, is when they say that evolutionary psychology is just so storytelling. 
It's post hoc just so storytelling. I mean, that is so profoundly idiotic that it is difficult to comprehend that these people are genuinely academics. And let me... And just to clarify for the listeners, when someone says in science, let's say, oh, that's a just so story, it's like, it's, it's, they're, essentially, they're essentially saying, you're just weaving an account of describing how this phenomenon occurs exactly. without any particular recourse to a testable hypothesis. Exactly. Yeah. So let's do the just so storytelling. Uh, they think that because evolution is something that happened distally, it happened in the past, that that means that it can't be science. Well, if that's the case, then we better rush and tell astrophysicists that they are fake scientists because they study something not within the time scale of 2 million years, which might be the range of the evolution of human beings. They study something that is 14 billion years old, right? So all those astrophysicists, please rush and tell them they're out of a job. They're all fake scientists because they just wave hand wave stories post hoc. Uh, oceanographers, uh, paleontologists, geologists are all studying phenomena that happened in the distal past. So the idea that if something started in a distal past, you can't study it using the scientific method is so profoundly idiotic that it actually, look, even now I'm getting upset mentioning it, okay? So that's number one. Uh, the idea that something is not testable in evolutionary psychology, again, is so outlandish. I, I've now been a professor for 25 years. I've published many, many papers in all sorts of journals. You don't think I tested hypotheses? Here's a hypothesis. In the maximally fertile phase of their menstrual cycles, women are most likely to beautify themselves. In other, okay, That's a very easily falsifiable hypothesis. I collect data on women across their menstrual cycles. I see when they most beautify themselves. And if it is not within the very small window of their maximally fertile phase, that hypothesis is falsified. It's just, it, when someone argues this, the way I translate it is, I'm a moron who knows nothing, but I have to pretend I know something because I took a course in anti-evolution at Oberlin College. Okay? That's what they're saying. And there's a very, very long list of these morons that have crossed my path. To, to play devil's advocate, and it is devil's advocate because I'm, I'm on the same page as you here, but uh, uh, I imagine a lot of this comes from the baggage of social Darwinism, so let's say a generation yes. or two prior in, in, uh, in academia where people had these uh, scientific theories sort of at their fingertips at their disposal, and then they read cultural phenomena through an ideological lens using those scientific theories to explain the just-so stories that they wanted for political right. purposes, right? Right. So I, I, I suppose they're, like they may be coming from a good place when people make yes. those arguments, um, but why do, you think, uh, why do you think that has failed to penetrate the minds of these, as you say, otherwise very intelligent people. Because it's point. very, very difficult to get them to commit the necessary cognitive effort to actually understand that which they are criticizing. I mean, it's-, it's They just don't want to put the time or effort in. It's, it's, it's a human malady. It's a, it's a human frailty to be a cognitive miser, right? So, uh, so let me, but we're opening up a lot of- No, that's fine. Uh, okay. we'll take so a social out. Darwinism, for example, uh, uh, th this is the idea that, for example, eugenicists said, uh, look, uh, we, want to, uh, we don't want too many uh, uh, gays running around, so let's sterilize them so that we can purify and we, uh, the, the, the gene pool. Uh, let's get rid of, let's sterilize the Jews. Let's, uh, let's kill the Jews if you are a Nazi. Hey, what's wrong with, uh, it's a struggle between the races. We are the Aryans, the Jews are at the bottom. Hey, it's Darwinian. Okay. British class elitists said, hey, we are the upper social class, uh, screw the lower classes, uh, don't feed them, don't give them uh, education. Hey, that's just a natural struggle. The fact that someone, a, a Cretan, a miscreant, decided to misapply an evolutionary principle to suit their nefarious goals doesn't imply that this has anything to do with evolutionary theory. There is nothing in evolutionary theory that speaks to these points. This is like arguing uh, physics is a Nazi exercise because bruh, atomic bomb, okay? So, uh, right, uh, uh, let's not study mechanics in physics because that's how you learn about the trajectory of a, a bomb that you throw. So the fact that you create accurate knowledge about the world, which some uh, 
devil, some villainous uh, group decides to misuse to, to their nefarious pursuits, it says nothing about the evolutionary principles that they're supposedly criticizing. Uh, by the way, the blank slate premise, because you were saying they were coming maybe from a good place, uh, that point is actually well taken. Many of the cultural anthropologists who argue that there are no human universals argued that precisely because it is a very hopeful message for us to think that we are all born with equa potentiality. You mean really mom, I could be the next NBA superstar? There is nothing that differentiates me at the starting point between me and Jordan? That's how, that's how Trump became president. That's how, <laughs> right? so, so there is a hopeful message, right? But uh, uh, a hopeful message that's rooted in BS is still an injury to truth. And therefore that's why they upset me. But now going back to the falsifiable stuff, so there is uh, something that I've been really pushing uh, recently uh, in my work, which will also be in, in my next book, this idea of how do you build a scientific argument, uh, typically with an evolutionary theory? How do you demonstrate that something is an adaptation? Well, you build what are called nomological networks of cumulative evidence. Nomological? Nomological networks, okay. Uh, and so if somebody, somebody can read my book, they could also look at a, a very short paper that came out, I think in 2004 by Schmidt and Pilcher. I know, I know I'm getting technical, but it's in psychological science where they lay out some of this mechanism. Uh, now I had been doing, unbeknownst to me that they had proposed it, in building my arguments against all these hostile crowds, I was actually doing this nomological network approach. Then I found a name for it. And now I've been really pushing that framework uh, and building on it in all of my work. That's, that's nice and sort of reassuring with respect to the validity of one's work when someone comes along and says, this is what you should be doing. And you say, well, how about that? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. so, so what is nomological? So nomological Maybe we networks that. Is, works as follows. And actually the guy who did it originally without calling nomological network independently, great minds think alike, was none other than Charles Darwin. Because when Charles Darwin built his evidence for, uh, well, for uh, theory of natural selection, he did it over 20 plus years of observations across a huge number of disciplines. So it's not as though he ran a study with 30 undergraduate students at Ohio State University and decided that based on this sample, he now has a universal forevermore. He actually collected data from geology, from biodiversity, from zoology, from animal husbandry, from paleontology, all of which bit by bit demonstrated that his theory is correct. So now let me formalize that process which I had been doing independently, Darwin had been doing independently, uh, and then now formalize in this nomological network. Nomological networks of cumulative evidence is the idea that if you wanna demonstrate that a phenomenon is in an adaptation, you have to look for as many disparate sources of lines of evidence. Not that you necessarily collect, and this is not a literature review. So let me, if I give you a specific example, you'll get it. Uh, the waist to hip ratio of the hourglass figure is a adaptive preference that men hold. This is for women, right? The, idea, women. the idea that women who have Should an hourglass hold. figure exactly. are more attractive. Exactly. Okay. And so typically evolution psychologists, well not typically, evolution psychologists argue that the, the range is 0.68 to 0.72, which corresponds to the hourglass figure. And the idea is that there are clear evolutionary reasons why men would prefer a woman who signals that particular morphological trait. But Gad, I know someone who hey. doesn't have that exact preference, so you I, must be completely... Very good. Uh, my, my, my aunt... Uh, Linda is taller than my uncle Bob. So what you're saying that men are taller than women is pure bullshit, Dr. Saad. That's another typical cognitive bias of the morons and the intellectually deficient. Uh, now, and if I use these strong words, it's not just to be humorous or hyper, it, it, it really is because they are an injury to truth. One of the things that defines my being, both as a public intellectual and as a scientist, is I'm genuinely moved. I'm injured by the constant attacks on truth. And ultimately, these people, many of whom are academics, 
should be smarter than to be committing these errors. But they are so ideologically blinded that they're unable to extricate themselves from their biases. And to me, that makes them intellectual terrorists, right? They are attacking the edifices of reason and science, right? No serious scientist questions evolution. To question evolution is to, is to be part of the flat earth society. It's the same thing. You're part of the same group of folks. Okay. But anyway, so to go back to nomological networks. So the waist to hip ratio, how do I demonstrate that it is adaptive? Well, first, I can offer you theoretical explanation that argues that sexual selection is the mechanism by which in a sexually reproducing species, males and females evolve certain preferences in the opposite sex. So there is a very clear theoretical mechanism that explains how that preference would have been coded. Okay. Now I'm going to give you medical data. Well, it turns out that women who exhibit that uh, ratio are healthier, are usually younger. We lose that shape as we get older, are more likely to conceive. So now I have very clear reproductive and medical currency that if you have that uh, shape, it results in the exact evolutionary calculus that we care about, which is you either reproduce or don't. Okay, now I'm going to show you data, cross-cultural data, universal data, not from, only from your lab in Ohio State. I'm going to go to the Yanomama in, 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 in the Amazon, and I'm going to go to the Bedouin tribe in the Negev desert, and I'm going to repeat it in 50 cultures, and guess what? They're all going to show that that figure. So now look what I've gotten so far, and I'm going to give you a lot more. I've gotten you a box of theoretical data or explanation, then a medical reproductive stuff. Then I've gotten you cross-cultural human universals. Now I'm going to give you data where that preference was captured, not only through paper and pencil tasks. Tell me which of these per women you find most beautiful. I'm going to give you eye tracking data. I'm going to give you brain imaging data. Men's pleasure centers light up more neuronally when they are exposed to women who hold that preference. Now it seems like I'm really building a lot of data in support of what I'm saying. It sure doesn't sound like I'm just hand-waving bullshit arguments. Let's keep going. Now I'm going to get you data from prostitutes that shows that prostitutes who have that hourglass figure uh, can command larger fees. Now I'm going to show you data study done by me where you take, in, I did it 48 different countries. I had an undergraduate student code a data of female escorts who advertise themselves online. Uh, my name is Susie. Uh, my height is this. My weight is this. Here is my waist to hip ratio. So he did it for 48 different countries. And guess what the figure came out to? Now, some, some person will say, oh, but how about if they're lying? Who cares if they're lying? It doesn't matter if they're lying. The point is, what are they advertising, right? So let me repeat. Now, I've gotten you theoretical data. I've gotten you medical data. I've gotten you cross-cultural human universal data. I've gotten you multiple methods data, right? Using brain imaging, using eye tracking, using paper and pencil task, right? I've gotten you prostitute data. I've gotten you online female escorts data. Now I'm going to get you data looking at content analysis of Playboy magazines and Miss America over many years, many decades. Do they all have that figure? It sounds like grueling work that no one would really want to do. <laughs> Actually, the, the undergraduate student in question, when he asked me to work on a project and I gave him this project, his response was, I love you, Professor Saad. <laughs> That's the only appropriate response, I'm sure. Uh, so I'll just give you one or two. As a cis heterosexual male. This was a, heter a cis heterosexual male, exactly. Uh, so then uh, there is data looking at, uh, I think it was uh, Greco-Roman, uh, uh, Indian data, African. Uh, uh, these are uh, uh, traditions of art coming from antiquity, from Africa, from uh, India, where they took figurines uh, from... 2,500 years ago, and they can actually calculate the waist to hip ratio, it supports it. Right. Now I'm going to give you the coup de gras, the, the, the killer. If, if all this other data were not enough, you could take, you ready? Is everybody listening? <laughs> you could take congenitally blind men, men who have never had the gift of sight. 
make them go through that preference task using what? Haptically, by touch, and guess what they choose? So does that sound like it is just so storytelling? No. Evolutionary theory, its epistemology, actually sets the evidentiary threshold unbelievably higher than the rest of the sciences. An evolutionist is profoundly more rigorous as a scientist than your BS guy at doing his undergrad studies in the lab. But they can't be bothered to say, oh, so Professor Saad, you just came out of this out of nowhere. So that's what upsets me because it, you know, it's like, it's like when I'm accused, I'm a Jewish person who escaped Lebanon. I'm accused of being a Nazi Jew hater. Okay. Well, so here's an academic person who says that evolutionary theory is nothing but just so storytelling when the exact opposite is the truth. So that's why it offends me and, and angers me. Yeah. That can be really infuriating. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, especially when it's, I suppose, when it's done from what appears to be a place of uh, ignorance or uh, essentially just lack of effort, like lack intellectual effort. laziness. Cognitive laziness. Uh, a second example that I'd like to ask you about to see if you can guess it. Who do you think around the world since time immemorial is the most dangerous person in a woman's life? The most dangerous person in a woman's yeah. life. Like in other words, if something is going to go bad yeah. uh, in a woman's life in terms of her being attacked, in terms of her being abused, in terms of her being killed, who is that person? Going off my sort of Netflix CSI type knowledge, I'm going to say it's always the ex-boyfriend, so a former lover. Exactly. It doesn't have to be former lover. It could be current lover. Current lover. her husband. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the reason why he would either kill her or attempt to kill her or be beat her or whatever. What do you think? My guess would be um, jealousy, suspicion of cheating. Something exactly. Like there you go. Okay. So we can go again to the Yanomamo tribe in, in the Amazon. We can go to neighborhoods in Detroit in 1950. We can go back 3000 years. We can go 3000 years from now and we're going to find the exact same reality that I just described. The most dangerous man in a woman's life is not a serial killer who's hiding in the tree about the jumper. It's the man whom she's coupling with. And what's going to drive her, drive him into a murderous rage is going to be either realized or suspected infidelity. Sometimes it's suspected and yeah, it's not yeah. even true. That's right. Okay. It doesn't make a difference right. from the male perspective. Exactly. Now, why does he do that? Because paternity uncertainty. Uh, you, you, and now you're giving an ultimate cause. I'm giving an ultimate cause. Exactly right. And here is, by the way, where the detractors who say, oh, are you justifying the murder of women? Yes. Of <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. You, you must love woman murder. Exactly. Yeah. I love, I'm, I'm pro woman murder. Again, the, the answer. That will not be taken out of context. <laughs> just make clear for uh, audiences. Right. Uh, the, the, the reality is that if you want to understand the dreadful reality of abusing and murdering women, you better root the, your explanation in an accurate scientific explanation. The fact that you offer an explanation as to why men do it doesn't mean you're for it, doesn't mean you're condoning it. It means that if you want to understand it and try to intervene in, in softening it, reducing it, you better root it in reality. Uh, so here were two examples from both my, uh, from that book, the step parenting with child abuse, the, the stuff that I just mentioned now, which when I read that in their book, it was so elegant. It was so parsimonious. It was in, in one swoosh, they're able to explain stuff that all collectively the social scientists are sp spinning over their tail, you know, concocting BS stories. I said, I found my calling. I wanted to study consumer behavior. Uh, and now I found this evolutionary lens. And that's how I then eventually ended up founding the field of evolutionary consumption. And why consumer behavior? What about that interests you? So I wanted, I'm always interested in very broad things that could then be applied everywhere. So evolutionary theory can be applied everywhere. Consumer behavior, in my view, is where all the sexy stuff of our human nature manifests itself, right? I mean, I could have been a, you know, a psychologist who studies uh, the processing of fear in the amygdala, but that to me is too restrictive. I'm a broad thinking guy. Consumer behavior seemed like the type of field that had enough applications, but had a lot of manifestations of who we are as, as, as in terms of manifesting our human nature. So, uh, and I'd also done an MBA, 
uh, I, had, I had taken, uh, my background was very technical, mathematics, computer science, but I'd always been very interested in the behavioral sciences. At one point, I thought of going more into clinical work and then decided against it for two main reasons. Number one, I thought that I didn't have the right personality to uh, not bring the trouble home, uh, precisely because I'm very intense and I care a lot. And so if I'm going to hear about how some woman was abused or some girl was sexually, uh, it, I don't think I would have had the right ability to compartmentalize. So that would have quickly led me either to murder the per people who did it or commit suicide. So it didn't seem like it was a good fit. A short career. A short career, very short career. I go out in a bang, literally. Uh, the second uh, reason why I thought it would be a bad idea for me to go to clinical work was that I thought that uh, a lot of the clinical fields, the therapeutic industry was really built, and here I'm going to borrow a, a book title, uh, built on a house of cards. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a book by Robin Dawes, uh, I think in 1994, where he basically said that much of, you know, clinical stuff is complete utter BS. Now, that, that, now that doesn't mean that clinicians may not be uh, rooted in part in science, but a lot of the history of uh, therapeutic industry is complete quackery. And being someone who was very science oriented, I felt that I didn't want to commit to something that was on shaky grounds. And so I was very, very interested in decision making and in, in, in consumer behavior. And, but I was going to Cornell to really be a mathematical modeler of consumer choice. I was going to be a, a, what they call a quant jock. Uh, because of my background in, in you know, mathematics and so on. Uh, and it's at Cornell, I met uh, Jay Russo, who is, as I said, a mathematical and cognitive psychologist, uh, who really uh, gave me the courage to kind of pursue my interest in behavioral sciences. And then that's how eventually, by accident, I discovered evolutionary psychology and so on. So, so something that uh, kind of pops up in my mind and, and um, uh, something that I wonder about, and I imagine other people wonder about when they hear about your particular departmental posting, is it, is it because you're, uh, I mean, sort of ideologically or just personality-wise, you're a gung-ho capitalist and you want to, you know, facilitate... To be in the business school? Yeah, yeah facilitate better under, you know, a, be a better functioning capitalist system by using evolutionary no. techniques. Z no, z absolutely not. It, it, it really is... Be Look, I could, be, I could be housed in a psychology department. I could be a behavioral biology department. Uh, it, I'm really housed in the business school because much of the places where I apply the evolutionary thinking is related in one way or another to our consumatory nature. And so maybe that's because I think you had asked me, how do you apply this in, in business school and so on? So maybe that gives people a sense. So I discussed earlier a study uh, where, I, where I was talking about the, can you falsify a hypothesis where I said, women dress more provocatively when they're in the maximum fertile phase. Well, that's actually, I was describing one of my studies with my, one of my former doctoral students. So here I'm looking at a very specific consumer choice, how I beautify myself as a woman, right? I mean, our, our, my fashion choices is consumer behavior. That consumer choice, should I wear my hair up or down? Do I wear stilettos or not? How scantily clad I dress? Whether I put makeup or not? Each of those, I mean, couldn't be more consumer behavior. All of those patterns of beautifications are rooted in the physiological reality of where I currently am in my menstrual cycle. So I take a principle from animal behavior from evolutionary theory that females of a species are going to maximally engage in sexual signaling when in estrus. And I take that principle and I now look for it in consumer behavior. Okay. Here's another example uh, with one of my other graduate students. I looked at uh, sexual signaling, but now on the male side. The first case was menstrual cycle, female side. Now let's apply it to men's male side. Well, we know from many species that males, when they fight one another, the one who, has a ri who wins has a rise in his testosterone. The one who loses literally, in some cases, has the tail between his legs and runs off, and his T levels, his testosterone levels, drop. Right, and this is sort of a, a temporally contextual thing. Like for, for a period of time, one of the, the aggressor has more testosterone. Than exactly. Than, yeah, yeah that's it. a situational response. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so testosterone is both an antecedent and a post. Uh, so uh, if I have greater testosterone, I'm more likely to be aggressive. That's an antecedent effect. 
you and I fight, my testosterone goes up, yours goes down, that's a consequence. So it's a feedback loop. So we should see some people just constantly jacked up on testosterone unless they end up, you know, uh, incarcerated. Right. And other people just really low T, getting by, head down, it's, it's looking fun, at the sidewalk. It's funny that you say incarcerated because I always tell people the best way to make sure that someone uh, is no longer a criminal, just let them age. Because just by aging, your testosterone level naturally drops. And the things that you were willing uh, and uh, to do when you were 22 you're unwilling or incapable to do. I mean, I'm talking about criminal behavior. Is this, is this why I'm so bad at uh, jujitsu? Because <laughs> That's, we'll do, we'll I'm already do. in my late thirties, is that? Oh, you're, you're past the window. It's, it's, all, it's it. all downhill from now. Yeah. Uh, so, so I took this idea of male to male combat. I also took the idea from the animal kingdom of uh, males who engage in sexual signaling in, as intersexual wooing to impress the lady. Sexual selection operates in one of two ways. It's either two rams, male rams who butt heads and the winner wins and gets sexual access to the females. That's called intrasexual rivalry. It's within the, the same sex fighting each other. And some forms of sexual selection is intersexual wooing. You evolve a trait to impress the ladies directly. So the peacock's tail is the classic example, right? The peacock's tail is basically what's called in evolutionary biology, a costly signal, or it's also called a handicap. It's also called an honest signal. All of these uh, terms uh, relate to one another because here's what it's saying. Look at the tail I have. It is very burdensome. It's very heavy. It increases the likelihood of my falling prey to a predator. It makes me more conspicuous to a predator. Therefore, this tail could not have evolved through natural selection because it doesn't confer survival advantage to me. As a matter of fact, it reduces my survivability. So if it has evolved, it must have evolved through a, another process called sexual selection because it confers mating advantage. Both natural and sexual selection is what Darwin proposed mm -hmm. originally. And so uh, that tail, for it to be an honest signal for the hens who are looking for the top male to be able to differentiate the truly top male from the pretenders, from the fakers, the, the signal has to be costly because the fakers have to not be able to imitate it. So only because I'm here standing before you with this big tail, trust me, I'm giving you the honest signal you should mate with me. So, and so just to clarify for our, for our listeners or viewers here, so is, is, correct me if I'm wrong, but the implication there is that I have such a big tail that unless I was uh, a real alpha, it would be such a hindrance to me that I would have been eaten by a lion like exactly. generations ago. Exactly. Yeah. That's why it's a costly signal. Yeah. That's why it's called the handicap principle. Right. It I, has... can afford, I can afford to be handicapped because I'm such a stud. Exactly. Yeah. This has also been referred to as Zahavian signaling because uh, Amos Zahavi, a Israeli ornithologist, demonstrated this with Arabian babblers. So there are many different... Which is a species of bird. <laughs> yes. No, he wasn't being Arabophobic. Uh, so, so I take this principle, I go, uh -huh, guess what? I can demonstrate exactly this phenomenon in the consumer realm. Well, in Montreal, downtown, it's one big lek, lek, L-E-K. What's a lek? It's a zoological term that captures, so a species could be a lekking species if it does this. It's a physical space where typically the males of the species go and start showing off. And at the periphery of the lek, the females stand very judiciously looking for the top male, and then they choose, this is the top guy. Oh, so you're talking about St. Catherine Street and then <laughs> and, and the pedestrians that walk on either side of said street. Look at you, Mr. Big Shot. So, uh, St. Well, Catherine not, Street. not me, unfortunately, but the, but the people driving the nicer well, you cars. Have, you have height, so you're already pretty good. When <laughs> I met you outside, you towered over me. That's, that's already giving you some points. That's the only reason I'm here today. Yeah. So uh, uh, the street actually is uh, that we use for the study. I'm about to say it actually went through Crescent, but it, uh, through uh, uh, St. Catherine, but it, then it turned into Crescent, which is the real club zone. Yeah. yeah. Well, I argued that much of what we do as consumers is nothing but lacking behavior, and so now how am I going to test this? Well, uh, and I always joke that try to get the granting agencies to give you a Porsche. 
Uh, I was just thinking, like, don't you have to go through behavioral research ethics boards <laughs> for this? Because we have enough problems just asking people surveys about exactly. seafood they eat and stuff like that. Exactly. Well, you can't even ask them what their gender is now. You can't even ask them what their income because that's culturally insensitive. You can't ask them what their biological sex is because it's... it's so how did you get away? Who did you bribe? <laughs> no one. I, the truth uh, was my defense or my pitch. And so with one of my former graduate students, we uh, rented a Porsche. And we had a beaten up old sedan as a second car. And we brought in young men to, uh, to the lab. Did you draw straws for this or? No, so this was actually within subjects. So what that means basically, it's not half the subjects do the Porsche, half the subjects do the sedan. The same subjects did each condition. And so each subject did uh, four conditions. Uh, drive the Porsche in the lek, meaning on Crescent, Crescent Street. Street on a semi-deserted highway, actually Highway 20, which is pretty close to where we are right now, uh, and do the same thing with the sedan. So you have four conditions. And the dependent variable, the dependent measure, was salivary assays to measure your fluctuating testosterone levels. Right, so you're, you're, you're testing to see if that changed as a factor of which, as a function of which car you were driving. Exactly. And perhaps not surprising to anyone other than the BSers in the social sciences departments, uh, put a young man in a Porsche and his endocrinological system explodes. To our surprise, we found... Not, not literally. <laughs> not literally. Uh, but to our surprise, we found that... What, uh, so we had predicted what I just said would happen, but we thought it would happen a lot more when there's an audience, the lek, than on the... And actually, the testosterone shot through the roof whether it was on the semi-deserted highway or... Now, oh, interesting. It, yeah. So is it, it's just the pure purr of the engine? It's, no, well, no, it's the, in, it's the uh, imbuing of very high social status. I got the big win. I won the Olympic medal. I just beat up four guys. So that testosterone response, I get into the car. Why, why when young men are driving on Crescent, they always are blasting the music and rolling down the windows? I mean, why don't they just... It's because, because I need to... Because they're assholes. No. <laughs> Because I need you to look at me. I mean, notice that I'm driving this car, okay? Uh, we, we had a second study, which I won't talk about here. But So here's another example of how I took principles from evolutionary biology that uh, manifest themselves across many species. And then I say, well, how can I demonstrate that reality in the consumer context? And so this is really how much of my career has unfolded. It is to take evolutionary biology, evolutionary psychology, and demonstrate how it occurs uh, in, in our consumatory nature. Hence, one of the books I wrote was The Consuming Instinct. Right. Uh, how juicy burgers, Ferraris, pornography, and gift giving, what they reveal about human nature. Now, why did I choose, by the way, those four examples? Juicy burgers, Ferraris, pornography, and gift giving. It sounds like pretty good research material to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> so I can eat all the exactly, exactly. So I could consume pornography, right. Yeah. Uh, it's because, uh, so I argue in a, a lot of my work that much of consumer behavior could be mapped onto four basal Darwinian modules. Survival, reproduction, kin selection, and reciprocal altruism. Kin selection being you want your uh, those related to you to do better than those who are not related to you, or you have more preference for. Uh, that's exact. So, for example, the reason why I love my biological children more than I might my stepchildren or random children is precisely because it, you and I are not ancestors of people who were uh, randomly allocating their uh, parental solicitude, if you like. Okay. Yeah, we're here because our ancestors cared more for their own children than for exactly. others. Exactly. So kin selection is the mechanism that explains why I would jump into a river to save three brothers, even though I might end up dying, right? If, if all that mattered is the, uh, that I uh, survive myself, then you wouldn't see across a huge panoply of species this incredible kin-based altruism, where I actually am willing to completely risk being eaten by a predator if in the burrow there is a packet of genes that are linked to me that constitute more than if I were to die, okay? So that's kin selection. And reciprocity is the mechanism that explains why I would jump into a river to save a friend who's not my kin, or to save even more paradoxically, but it's not really that paradoxical, a stranger, 
Okay. Well, so I basically argue that these four basal mechanisms ultimately explain tons of consumer phenomena. Uh, not all. It doesn't explain why I may like bowling and you may like fishing. Those are just individual differences, vagaries. Our, our unique personhoods are manifesting themselves. That's fine. So it's not as though evolutionary theory explains everything, but it certainly explains a lot. And so one of the things that I try to do in, uh, in, uh, that I've tried to do throughout my career is to say, uh, of course, socialization matters. Of course, culture matters. Of course, the environment matters. No one is negating that. No serious evolutionist thinks that we're not socialized. But first of all, socialization happens of its form because of biology. But secondly, by completely ignoring the biological forces that make us managers, employers, employees, traders, all of the things that we study in a business school, why people go to great lengths to get an MBA, you could study all that without once mentioning the word biology. How could that be? Think if you were an animal behaviorist for two million other species. In every species, the study of behavior would be completely rooted in a, some biological mechanism. Mm -hmm. Not for humans. Humans are somehow the only species that exists outside of biology. Well, that's crazy. That brings us to an interesting point because you have pretty outspoken views about religion and sort of, and belief systems that shape the way that humans behave and have behaved for thousands of years. And to some degree, religion or other sort of deep-seated belief systems can probably explain why there's a lot of resistance to viewing people through an evolutionary or biological lens. Sure. Yet at the same time, um, and this, I'm playing a bit of devil's advocate here, but um, some, of, uh, some of my colleagues and people you may know, like Joe Henrik, uh, Aaron Oren Zion and people like this have focused on how religion itself, if looked at through a cultural evolutionary lens, sure. is actually very adaptive yes. and has been very adaptive yes. throughout time. And that's how you explain phenomena that kind of come together and look like what we call today religion. So I'm just curious, as someone who's a, both an evolutionary psychologist um, and recognizes the importance of cultural, uh, you know, um, both culture gene evolution yeah. as a sort of a feedback loop, as well as as well as uh, as well as how ideologies can shape people's views this way. How do you how do you reconcile your if hopefully I'm not mis uh, characterizing you. But you can correct me if I am. Your relatively hostile views towards organized right. religion, right? With this with a, quite a bit of research that's shown that organized religion is extremely adaptive, has been very adaptive, and that's one of the reasons that you and I sure. are alive here today. So how do you yes. how do you weigh those? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So let me give you a broad explanation of the class of uh, evolutionary-based explanations of religions, of religion. So one, you could look at a cultural form, let's call religion a cultural expression, and say, is, is, there, an ad, is there an adaptive value to that form having evolved? So, okay. so that would be David Sloan Wilson, the evolutionary biologist, who was a good friend, who basically says groups who are inherently more religious because they have greater communality, greater cohesion, greater in-group, out-group demarcation lines, so on, are going to out-survive groups that don't have religiosity. And therefore, he offers here an adaptive explanation for the evolution of religion, in his case, rooted in group selection, mm -hmm. which itself is a contentious issue. As contentious, well. yeah. But, cult, but again, this is on a cultural level that he's arguing. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So in that case, one form of evolutionary explanation is that you have to demonstrate that that cultural form is itself an adaptation that confers, in this case, survival advantage. Yeah, okay. survival of one community. Versus another. Yeah, one community with a certain set of ideas or beliefs versus communities that don't hold those ideas or beliefs, right? This is where it gets confusing for people, I think, because they think of evolution, okay, evolution is biological, we're talking about biology, but now we're actually leaping to the selection of ideas and, and behavioral traits. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and there, when you mentioned earlier, gene culture co-evolution feedback loops, that's another, remember earlier I talked about uh, behavioral ecologists and ethologists and evolution psychologists and Darwinian anthropologists, we can put as another group gene culture co-evolutionists. These are the guys who do the dual inheritance models that, that study how there's a feedback between culture and uh, uh, you know, genes. Yeah, we can make a quick plug here for Joe Henrik's book. 
the secret of our success. You owe me, Joe. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Joe's a great guy. He's now at Harvard. He used to be at UBC. That's right. Yeah, yeah. we lost him. Uh, yeah, there Maybe. you go. Ho hopefully for the best. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a second class of another approach for infusing evolutionary thinking into the study of religion is to say, no, religion is not an adaptation. Religion is an exaptation. Exaptation means a byproduct. It's a, it's a, it's an, uh, an, a, an, an outcome of something, but that didn't itself evolve because it is adaptive. So the color of our skeletal system is whatever color it is, not because it is adaptive for it to be that, it's because there is a path dependency. There's an evolutionary trajectory that leads to that outcome. Right, so the argument here, just to, to sum it up quickly, I suppose, is we have certain, uh, like it's, it's adaptive for us to be hypervigilant about animals that may be walking behind us and want to eat us. Boom. Yeah, and then be, because we have that, be, otherwise we'd get eaten, right? right? So we have a hypersensitivity to that, but because we're hypersensitive to minds that might be out there in the forest, then we end up coming up with things like forest spirits and forest spirits evolve into gods and from there we Exactly. Really so that is using the agency detection uh, module. Let's, let me give you another one just so that people can get a, a broader sense of how that mechanism works. Uh, we've evolved the very strong penchant for coalitional thinking. Uh, there's us, there's them, there's blue team, there's red team. There is all the members of my group and everybody else is to be suspected and to be the enemy. Well, what do many religions and certainly Abrahamic religions do? They exactly give me a narrative that, I'm exact, that is exactly in line with me wanting to view the world that way. There are Jews and there are the Gentiles. There are the believers in Islam and the kuffar, the, un the unbelievers. There are in Christianity those who uh, take Jesus in their heart and go to heaven, the rest of us who are going to burn in hell. So, it's, so that coalitional mechanism that has evolved for completely different purposes, now religion comes piggybacks on it, uses the same uh, neuronal expectations, if I could put it that way, and then goes off running with it. Yeah. So that's a completely different way to use evolutionary thinking to explain why religion exists. It says that there is no adaptive value to religion. It's just piggybacking. That's the similar explanation is used for, say, literature, the existence of literature. A few people have tried to offer an adaptive explanation for literature, but I think the main game in town from an evolutionary perspective is that literature is, if you like, is a byproduct, is an exaptation of these big brains that experience that love to tell stories, that love to gossip and so on. And now literature comes in and offers you a way to express that, okay? So that would be a second way. A third way would be, uh, so this is Laura Betzik, who's a Darwinian historian, who did a great study looking at, the, she did a content analysis of the Bible uh, where she looked at the status of male protagonists in the Bible and then the number of sexual partners they were associated with. Because she wanted to test the idea that with greater social status comes much higher reproductive fitness. And guess what? It turns out that God is a committed Darwinist because it perfectly maps onto that reality. So you're saying if you go back and look at the, the, the Bible narratives, people like Abraham or other... Well, isn't that sort of circular? Saying like the head of the tribe has the most has the highest fecundity? Or maybe I might be missing something on that. Uh, the, 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 the general, the king, yeah. has more women and more sex yeah. than the, the, the farmer. Right, okay. okay. In other words, if you look at reproductive fitness across the, the two sexes, uh, men's reproductive fitness is extraordinarily more variable. Some men have 800 children, some men twiddle their fingers in, in frustrated apathy, right? Whereas women, irrespective of their mating quality, their variance is almost nil. Number one, just because of the fact that they have to bear the children. Yes, exactly. They're sort of limited. And there are other reasons too. Just that the, 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 the very, it's not as though there are women who have 12 children, some have zero. Some, right. you, they all end up roughly at the same final reproductive fitness. Now, the right. quality of the 
children, quality in a mating sense. Yeah. Uh, if if, if a, gorgeous, a beautiful woman marries a high status man, then they will pass on some traits that will make their children more likely to be successful in the mating market. So that might be true. But the number, if the currency is the reproductive fitness in terms of numbers, men's reproductive fitness is much more variable. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that the Bible perfectly captures that. So in this case, what you're showing is that certain evolutionary realities manifest themselves in exactly the way you would expect them, even in these divine books. So that would be another approach to applying an evolutionary lens to studying religion. Oh, I see what you're saying. Like you can see tra these books are, are supposedly come from supernatural sources. Exactly. And yet, maybe not but, but uh, and simultaneously when you look at their content, you see our evolutionarily prescribed uh, outcomes manifested in the exactly. stories. Okay. And, yeah. so, and so the more general argument for within that class of explanations is what I, call, what I describe in several of my books as cultural products being fossils of the human mind. That's, this is what I call them. And so what I argue is that in the same way that the paleontologist uh, uses skeletal remains and fossils to reconstruct the phylogenetic history of a species, mm -hmm. so and with such detail that he could tell you what, what it eats from a species that's been extinct for 65 million years, well, our brains don't fossilize, they're organic material, but the, the cultural products that are left behind do fossilize. And therefore, I could study the ancient Greece, Greek poem mm -hmm. written 2,500 years ago in a completely different era, in a completely different culture, and completely understand the angst that the protagonist was facing. He doesn't know how to look at a smartphone. He doesn't know what that looks like. He'd be amazed to see a plane. So in a very superficial manner, he seems to be very different. The reality is his software that's running his brain is exactly similar to mine, which allows me to look at his narrative and understand that he is engaging in sexual longing and sexual rivalry and parent-child offspring. All of the main fundamental drivers of literary narratives are the same across all cultures. There's six, seven of them, okay? So here, you're using a different approach. You're saying, if I wanna understand human nature, I could unlock the mysteries of human nature by doing a content analysis on the cultural products that humans leave behind. Right, and you could do a cross-cultural analysis, I suppose, exactly. right? To look for the basic building blocks, if you will. Exactly. Yeah. And so again, this shows you how offensive it is, and I use that term uh, in the proper sense, uh, because a lot of people are falsely off offended all the time, how offensive to truth it is when all these Cretans say things like, oh, but evolutionary theory is just a bunch of uh, pretty boys sitting around with pipes and uh, coming up with just so stories. It's the exact opposite of that, right? Uh, there are studies in literary Darwinism. These are folks who, who study uh, uh, literature from a Darwinian perspective. Hmm. So literary Darwinists will analyze you know, a hundred novels coming from 20 different cultures and demonstrate that they're, they're like cut and paste. I mean, not in a literal plagiarized sense, but the storyline is identical. It manifests itself through different cultural contexts, but the fundamental drivers are the same. Now, is the guy who is spending five years coding a hundred different literary genres engaging in just so stories? And, and then I would ask the person who is levying that, that, that accusation, I bet that that guy's rigor is about a thousand times more than your study where you ran it with 30 undergraduate students at Ohio State and then BS enough with the P hacking so that you got the P value that you wanted. So cut the BS, man. Stop being an intellectual terrorist. I mean, there is no other game in town to understand the fundamentals of human nature other than evolution. So get on board or... Or, or, sh or shut up. I think that's a wonderful argument for an evolutionary framework angle. So on the religion point, yeah. uh, how do you reconcile? Got it. Got it. Yeah. You asked me that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we can argue whether the adaptive argument for religion is the best one or whether the exaptation one. But let's suppose I grant that there are adaptive value. There, there is an adaptive value for religion. Something could potentially be beneficial but it's still BS, right? So in other words, I don't necessarily have to, uh, uh, well, let's even take a non-evolutionary uh, explanation that fits within that mold. Although game theory is itself uh, typically within evolutionary game theory. Okay? The, the prisoner's dilemma, many of you, uh, many of the viewers might know it. You have prisoner A, prisoner B, uh, 
he could squeal or not, the other guy could squeal or not, and then what's the best way to act? Well, the original prisoner's dilemma, if you like, without calling it that, was proposed by uh, uh, Pascal, Blaise Pascal, Pascal's wager for uh, why you should believe in religion, right? God could exist or God could not exist. Uh, I could believe or I could not believe. There are different payoffs. There are four cells, and then he's going to tell you uh, the benefit, you know, the, the payoffs in each cell, and he comes to the conclusion of, therefore, believe. Well, but, so there could be benefits to believing, even though I'm believing in a fairy tale. So, to, so at the most pure level, I'm, uh, I have antipathy towards religion because to me, it's a fundamental attack on truth. Now, if religion wishes to simply say, uh, you know, some moral prescription, although one could argue that uh, the moral instructions in the religious books are many times hardly moral. Uh, so if that's the best selling point of religion, I may have a problem with it, right? Take your insolent children to the gates of the city and stone them to death. No, 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 Professor Saad, that was meant allegorically. It was meant metaphorically, right? So usually the religious people have a, a very keen ability when, when uh, the religion prescribes something that today we would view as moral, take that as literal. When, it, when you, I show them a passage that is grotesque and immoral, no, 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 you misunderstood. It was meant as an allegory, okay? So bottom line is, it's an injury to truth. And secondly, it, it causes good people. I don't know if it was uh, the physicist who won the Nobel Prize at University of Texas, Steven Weinberg, I think, who said it first. Uh, only religion can make good people do bad things. Or what? I've heard that before, Sorry. sure, yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, a few days ago, we celebrate, celebrated the September 11th anniversary. 19 men woke up that day thinking that it was perfectly moral and perfectly the correct thing to do what they did. There was no way they would have gotten to that conclusion without religion. It's not as though they could have read Harry Potter and also arrived to that. They couldn't have read uh, Homer's uh, whatever and come to that conclusion. It required the exact content of religion to cause otherwise people who could have been very decent to do the most grotesque thing. So good people are going to do good things, bad people are going to do bad things, but only religion can get good pe people to do horrible things. And so, well, so what about the argument, um, I don't know if you know personally Aaron Noren Zion, a colleague of, of Joe Henrik, uh, right. um, who wrote this book, Big Gods, and, yes. some, and other people in that milieu with whom I'm familiar working at UBC, um, the argument that uh, it may be the case that good people do good things, but only uh, what began, at least, as religious narratives enabled people to effectively mentally um, uh, expand their uh, fictive kin group to the extent where they were able to trust and interact with a much larger number of people than their own individual tribe, which eventually led to uh, civilization. The fact that we could actually organize people in large enough groups that, you know, lo and behold, thousands of years later, we come up with, uh, you know, uh, secular social democracies and that sort of thing, but that none of that would have been popular, none of that would have been possible. Without it. Without some degree of, uh, again, fictive kin development, which religion in many ways uh, is all about, right? Enabling individuals to view others who aren't really related to them as if they're part of a larger in-group. So, yes. I, I mean, can, can we hold these ideas in our minds simultaneously? So, as you were speaking, I, I sort of have to come up with an explanation to rebut this, right? So, this is my first best attempt to counter that. So, remember earlier when I talked about homologies? A homology is if, if, if the structure of the forearm of humans ends up resembling very much the morphological features of the forearm of the cat, that is a homologous trait in that it demonstrates that both cats and humans have a common descendant. Right, or it's convergent evolution. That's what I'm gonna to get to to answer that to your next question. Okay. okay? Yeah. Convergent evolution would be where two traits or behaviors evolve independently of one another, hence not in any way demonstrating a common ancestor. So the flight abilities of bats and birds would be an example of convergent evolution. So now I'm gonna use that mechanism to take a first best attempt at what you said. Okay. 
Maybe religion is one way by which we can achieve what you said was argued, but there could be also alternate routes to get to that reality. In other words, it's not as though you only needed religion to expand, to use Peter Singer's term, the moral circle to, to groups other than your most immediate uh, in-group. So, I'm not moved by that argument because I do think we have all of the emotional and cognitive systems in us to have that expansion of the moral group without needing booga booga. Because the reality is there are more than 10,000 religions that exist. Those 10,000 religions on a thousand different points offer perfectly contradictory things. Mm -hmm. Are we allowed to eat prosciutto? Yes or no? God should be very clear about this. Well, God turns out to say very different things depending on which true religion I believe in. And I could offer you 16,000 from the most mundane to the most profound things, prescriptions of how to behave, and I will find you 50 religions that perfectly say Sure, other. even within a religion, you can find all sorts of contradictory stuff, right? So I don't buy it. So, so, so religion... Oh, oh yeah, but, but I mean, again, kind of to play devil's advocate, Please. just because it's interesting. So. Uh, that doesn't, th those points don't necessarily have to be mutually exclusive. You can have the content in terms of the prescribed behavior to be every time I walk through my front door, I have to do a circle three times and sit down like my dog before I enter and take off my right shoe and then pour the milk three times. And the, yes. Right? Like you can make it anything you want. It can yes. be totally nonsensical. But if you know that you see someone else doing that, you know, oh, they're part, they, they have the same sort of mental software running that I do. Therefore, I can trust them more than I can, than I can trust this complete stranger who does things the exact opposite way. I mean, the content itself is irrelevant. It's the recognition of similarity. Got it. Two points. Number one is, is, is the best way for me to appreciate that this person could be part of my shared humanity for me to do three loops and do booga booga this way and that way. I think I could find other ways for us to be united. And secondly, by uniting us in this way, it also makes us next step very uh, hostile to those who don't do flips this way right, and that way. But, but again, to not confuse a normative versus a descriptive sure. account, right? Descriptively, yeah, that would actually lead to successful groups, right? Not normatively, right? Right. So, so the the, the argument here, I, like Nora Zion and his colleagues, aren't saying religion is wonderful, but the, but they're saying, you know, I irrespective of any truth claims of right. these religions, it does explain through, you know, if you look at a bunch of different pathways yeah. uh, from a number of different dis disciplinary yeah. angles, it does explain how we got here. And yes. then what Nora Zion specifically, not to harp on him sure, in sure. particular, but he lays this out quite clearly. Um, argues is that what religion did is it enabled us to get to the size of a society uh, that was functioning well enough because of shared belief systems yes. that we could then uh, innovate uh, non-religious secular mechanisms for enforcing goodwill between people like courts, police, uh, you know, universal education, stuff like that. And then you can dispense with the quote unquote booga booga. But none of that, and then we can look at our, then we can look down at other people who are religious and say, well, come on, you're believing in all this ridiculous nonsense, right. which arguably is nonsense in many cases. Right. Um, yet at the same time, it's a little bit hypocritical in the sense if we don't acknowledge that the only way we could have got here, according to the argument, yeah. is the fact that we had these systems that enabled us to get to this point by expanding our fictive kin group. So. I, I mean, the, the, it's so the, it's, it's, the, the arguments are great, and you've summarized them well, and I'm familiar with them. And maybe the best way to then uh, to kind of draw an analogy again to some evolutionary organs. Well, ev everything is evolutionary based, but uh, you know, uh, the wisdom teeth don't carry the same importance today as they necessarily did in the past. Yeah, and the okay. appendix didn't. Why don't we put religion with that also? So, so I think. Look, uh, obviously, religion has existed for a long time. It is part of the human experience. And so uh, it's certainly worthwhile to explain why it is so compelling. My explanation actually is either extremely profound or maybe it's too, too much of a simple explanation. Here's my best attempt. When I have high cholesterol, I go see my physician. He gives me this thing called Lipitor and I bring it down. Now we can argue whether uh, that's linked to heart disease because now there's research that says that no, no, you, that doesn't matter. Let's assume that it is true that LDL scores, your fatty molecule of uh, cholesterol, needs to go down. That's solved. 
Are, is your business school sponsored by Big Pharma? Ah. <laughs> That's right. That's really why I'm here. There is this one problem that I can't solve. And as far as we know, I'm speaking now as mankind. Uh, we are the only species that is aware that we are on a death sentence, right? Robert Sapolsky, the wonderful neurobiologist uh, at Stanford, wrote a book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcer. Because zebras don't sit around in the savannah going, well, my left sucks, there's all kinds of predators, I could get eaten tomorrow. They live in the moment. True, seize the moment, okay? If the lions come at them, they take flight. If they escape them, they live to eat again. If they don't, they die a very horrible death. They don't have all the cortisol response that we do because they're not worrying about the past and they're not worrying about the future, they're living in the moment, right? Humans know that the, the party, this wonderful thing that you and I are doing here and I had the pleasure of meeting you today and all the work that I've done in my life and all this wonderful life, Wait, we're on the death sentence? I really don't like that. So I'd really like to go to see a physician to give me a pill for immortality. There is a pill. You know what that pill is called? Religion. So I don't need the fancy evolutionary arguments. I need a pill to solve the most fundamental existential crisis, which is I don't want the party to end. There's only one way to get to that, according to religion, and it's a very successful one. You're going to be reunited with. I just lost uh, a being that is more dear to me than 99% of humanity combined. That's my Belgian Shepherd. If there's any way for me to see her again, maybe I'll sign up, right? Or I can be brutally honest, maladaptively honest. That, yes, exactly. Maladaptively there you honest. Go. Yeah. That's why the atheist is actually on the wrong side of healthy thinking in that sense. Precisely. Because it is so much easier to believe. But my unique and brutal pursuit of truth, both to the outside world and in terms of my internal cognitive consistency, does not allow me to do that. So I want to sign up. Do, do you know of a ch church or synagogue I can go where I could be reunited with Samra, my Belgian shepherd? If yes, it's easier for me to say, so my God, I'm, I'm going to see her soon, maybe in 30, 40 years. But guess what? I'm not. She's and, ashes. But if our ancestors believed as you did that, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's offensive to truth, She's ashes, you'll never see her again. Would we be here today? Well, so, so then we could argue about that one. So, I, yeah. so I, as I said, I'm even willing to concede that there are wonderful uh, arguments for why religion was needed up to this point. It's a path dependency. Right. I'm not willing to argue for it on that premise because the highest ideal is truth and that injures it. Therefore, I'm against it. So you're saying normatively you can't argue for it, right. but descriptively... There might be right. Or pragmatically, there might be some, some value to it. Well, clearly there is, right? Some people choose to be very philanthropic because it was religion that made them. So clearly, religion makes us also do wonderful things. But from my view, by the way, there's, there's an old thing. Uh, 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 someone who has true virtue is when they do the right thing when no one's looking. Well, guess what? Religion removes that possibility. God is always looking. So that I not cheat on this test because it is wrong to not cheat or because God will punish me in the afterlife. If it's because God punishes me in the afterlife, I'm an asshole. If I don't cheat, even though no one could ever see me, that's virtue. And that's the standards I abide by. God damn, I should be prime minister. <laughs> that's a great point to end on. Thank you so much, God. That was great. My pleasure.